Okay, great. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our Cambridge Chem Informatics meeting in February uh, 2021. Uh, so I will give a short introduction first for a few minutes. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, tell you a bit, little bit about the setup of the meeting and afterwards we will then uh, have three talks during this meeting. Um, so what, what are we trying to do with those meetings? Uh, so we are, in case you're new to the meetings, uh, we are bringing chem informaticians uh, together scientifically and personally. Uh, so it's chem informaticians in the widest sense, can be structural modeling, bioinformatics, basically life science data analysis, if you prefer. Uh, and there will be a scientific part, uh, that's the talks. And afterwards, there will also be meetings uh, where you, you can meet uh, individually as well and talk with each other. And that was actually one of the main aims of this meeting as well, uh, to have a part of science, but also some personal interactions, especially originally uh, between people in Cambridge. Uh, so usually we had maybe 30, 40, 50 people uh, attending over the last 10 years. So we were running those meetings for about 10 years now or so. Um, but now, uh, in terms of Corona, of course, um, we were moving online as well. And so now there are on average uh, 300 or so uh, registrations every time. So not everyone turns up, of course, but it's about 100 people or so turning up. And that's the number of participants um, right now as well. And uh, I was going through the list of people who registered uh, and in order to look for countries far away. So in particular, welcome to uh, people from the Philippines, please, uh, and Japan. So I think that's the uh, people who are furthest away uh, this time. And of course, usually that wouldn't have been possible. So that's one of the advantages of having those meetings online. Um, but welcome to everyone, of course, uh, wherever you are. Um, to announce the uh, next meetings, first of all, so you have those in the calendar as well. So they will be uh, held on Zoom. Uh, and so that's on the 2nd of June, 1st of September, and then again on the 24th of November. Um, and you can look up all future dates as well as registration details on c-inf.net, uh, as well as via the Cambridge Chem Informatics newsletter if you want to receive that. That's an email about sent once or twice a month with jobs and events and so on. Also some links to databases, um, blogs and so on in the chem informatics area. So you can see uh, drugdiscovery.net uh, for this as well. Or you can follow me on Twitter uh, in case you use that. Um, so the main meeting, so this meeting will be recorded as agreed with all speakers. So that was one of the questions before by one of the participants by Will. Um, and so all that recording will be made available uh, via YouTube in a few days. And so you can go to the same website, c-inf.net, uh, for the recordings. There are also recordings for the previous events in case you're interested in that as well. Um, afterwards, we will have uh, breakout rooms where you can talk to each other. So that part, of course, will not be recorded. That's just an informal uh, meeting afterwards. If you have questions, um, please feel free to type your questions in the chat window uh, to everyone along the presentation. Um, after the presentations are finished, uh, we will uh, go through some of the questions orally. So I would like to ask you to ask your question, please. Um, and we can do that as long as time allows. And afterwards, if the speakers would be so kind to please uh, follow up to the remaining questions and reply to all as well, uh, to everyone, in case other people are interested in the answer too. That would be great, thanks a lot. Um, and of course, so there will be presentations first. Uh, that's the uh, present part of the meeting, but uh, put your beer into the fridge, please, or whatever your preferred drink is, because afterwards uh, there's time to meet your fellow chem informaticians as well. And so everyone uh, who, who stays on uh, will be put into breakout rooms, six to eight people or so, so you can meet people you know, uh, or people you don't know yet, um, and talk to each other. And so that will go on as long as people stay. And if they're very small groups, I will merge them as well uh, in order uh, to meet new people actually uh, tonight as well. So please stay on uh, after the three talks in order to talk to uh, some of your friends as well. Um, and if you wish to present at one of the next meetings or if any information for me to circulate in the newsletter, uh, please let me know uh, and I'm very happy to include that as well. Okay, so that was my main introduction. Uh, welcome to everyone who's participating. I see it's around 37 people now. I think that's one of the biggest meetings we had so far. Uh, so welcome to everyone again. And let's move on then to the talks, first of all. So we have three presentations today. Um, one is on CLIFS, so Kinase Database by Albert Koistra. Then we will move on to Reverse Fingerprints by Andrew Henry, as well as Mixture Energies by Alex Clark. Um, and so I should point out it's the uh, triple A team today, Albert, Andrew, uh, and Alex. Uh, that's not by design, but it's a, a pure coincidence, of course. So uh, thanks a lot for your contributions, please. And I would like to hand over to Albert uh, for our first presentation, Cliffs Making Kinase Structures Work. So I will stop sharing and we'll hand over to uh, Albert. 
Yes, perfect. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Andreas. Thanks for uh, having me and uh, thanks for inviting me for uh, uh, presenting here. And um, this time I will present uh, about uh, the Kindness database cliffs and how this database can actually make Kindness structures work for you and also how to make sense of uh, Kindness structures. So for those who are not uh, really in the Kindness field, I will give a quick introduction. So Kindness 101, uh, there are about more than 500 different kinases in the human uh, genome. And uh, typical about these kinases it, is that they all have a structurally conserved kinase domain, as you can see here. So these kinases are key regulators of a cell function. And that's because these kinases cleave off a phosphate group of an ATP and then uh, tag it on uh, a substrate of uh, so a protein and thereby they can influence the activity of a protein and thereby influence the signaling network in um, the cell itself. Sometimes the signaling networks, uh, they become deregulated uh, and uh, therefore also inhibitors have been uh, designed. And therefore they are also very pivotal drug targets, especially uh, for cancer. Um, two approved inhibitors are listed here. So we have uh, sunitinib and lapatinib. And one of the main challenges uh, still in uh, kinase inhibitor design is to get ligands with the desired selectivity profile. So the ligands that hit only a few kinases uh, that are actually desired or a single kinase. And as you can see sunitinib here, on the left, it has um, uh, a higher affinity for uh, several different targets, whereas lapatinib is much more uh, selective. But, and that's because um, most inhibitors, they bind where ATP also binds. So that's a conserved element. So that uh, brings us to the kinase structure. So just to go a bit further into the kinase structures, uh, at the top of the kinase structures, we have the so-called N lobe. At the bottom, we have the C lobe. And in between these lobes, uh, in this cleft, ATP binds or also inhibitors can bind. Around this, we have uh, different uh, structural elements, so alpha helices and loop regions, and also conserved motifs that influence the activation state and also the catalytic activity of uh, kinases. And despite the fact that the crystal structures themselves are static snapshots, uh, keep in mind that uh, kinases themselves are actually quite dynamic proteins. Um, what you see here on the right in this video, it's actually not an MD simulation, but it's a morph between 30 different crystal structures of the same uh, kinase. So you see there's a lot of variability within the kinases. So one step back, how did the CLIPS database start? Well, it started about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, when uh, I was a PhD student and a fellow PhD student, Oscar, uh, he came to uh, my mentor, Chris Agrave, and I with one simple question. Can you align all available crystal structures for me for kinases? Because I want to do an analysis of how the inhibitors interact with the, uh, with the kinases and to analyze also the scaffolds. So that was a simple enough question, but actually uh, after two years, we were still working on this. And that actually led to the first publication of Glyphs as a data set and a whole analysis of how different scaffolds and chemical scaffolds can interact with kinases. Uh, after two years, we followed this up with uh, a website for Cliffs and uh, a dynamic database uh, that uh, was really available. And a few years later, we also did a comparison between eukaryotic kinases and atypical kinases. And we did this by also uh, encoding or adding the atypical kinases uh, to the Cliffs database. And only a few months ago, we published a whole new Cliffs uh, website and publish this in uh, nucleic assets research, the most recent one, uh, the most recent database edition. And that's not the only thing that changed, but because also a lot of um, crystal structures became available throughout the years. And it has grown from a bit more than 1700 crystal structures to now more than 5,000 crystal structures. And we're covering uh, about 65% of the whole uh, kinome. So we have good representations of uh, most kinases actually in cliffs. 
So what is Glyphs? So to uh, tell you a bit more about this, it's best probably to go back to the protocol that underlies Glyphs. And what Glyphs does is it checks every week at the protein data bank for new kinase structures. If it finds a kinase structure, then it splits the structure into different chains and models that are available. And then it aligns it against a, a master sequence alignment that we manually curated and a master structural alignment. And after that has been optimized, we decompose every, uh, every monomer in the structure. So we take out the protein, the, we annotate the pocket, we take out the ligand, uh, waters, ions, cofactors, and also the sequence alignment and integrate all of this into glyphs. And from there, we do annotation, calculation, curation, and presentation of the data. And this whole protocol is um, <clears throat> uh, powered by MOE. So the core element behind glyphs is uh, the annotation of the pocket. Um, because when we started looking at the kinases, we actually saw that when we overlaid all these kinases and all the inhibitors, that um, if we took 85 residues, we could capture more than 99% of all the interactions between the residues and uh, the inhibitors that we found. So that led us to um, come up with a numbering scheme for the kinase pockets. And uh, uh, so we have a numbering scheme going from one at the top here in the beta sheet one, and it moves all down to the activation loop uh, to a uh, number 85. And the huge advantage of this is that instead of uh, comparing different residue numbers in different structures, we can actually look at the, the Glyph's residue numbering. And that one is consistent throughout the different kinases, even though you're comparing across maybe different classes, different kinase groups, uh, this numbering is the same. You, so you can directly compare between them. And the annotation is uh, as follows. So we take the segment name, so for example, the alpha D helix, which is here, and then the glyphs residue numbering. So from there, we have the pocket, we have the residue annotations, and we have the ligand. And then the next step, which is also crucial uh, for glyphs, is to encode the interactions that the ligands have between the, uh, uh, that the ligands uh, make with the pocket. So for example, uh, for the satinib, uh, if we look at a single residue, we encode uh, seven different interaction types. And uh, in this case, uh, it's with a hinge uh, residue, and we check uh, for um, uh, hydrophobic in contacts, which are present. There are no aromatic uh, contacts in this case. We do have a hydrogen bond donor uh, and a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor, and no ionic interactions. So that gives us uh, one small bit string for one residue, but by encoding this for all 85 residues, we get a large bit string of 85 times seven. And that actually allows us to analyze interactions across different kinases and also um, just to pick out any specific interactions with each individual residue. Key for this is of course that we, uh, we check for the atom typing of the ligand because we're, it's PDB based. So we try to curate the atom typing and bond typing as good as possible, but there are still some issues there, but we do our best. Um, <clears throat> in the next step, um, we also annotate what different sub pockets are targeted by uh, each uh, kinase inhibitor. So in 2D, you see here a depiction of uh, the three main pockets. So you have the front pocket, the gate area, and the back pocket. And then here in the colored elements, you see different sub pockets that can be targeted and have been annotated. So in 2D, this looks very simple, but actually in 3D, this is a lot harder. And uh, for the first data set that we published, uh, Oscar and I, we did this manually, especially Oscar. Uh, but in order to make this an automated process, we needed to do this uh, in a smarter way. And that's when uh, George Kanev joined the team and he uh, came up with uh, the following solution. So he took all the annotations of the ligands that targeted the specific sub pocket and generated probes around each of the ligands. And uh, then 
uh, checked for each of them, these probes, each of these atoms, if they are in the vicinity of ligands that did not target these uh, subpockets. And by excluding all the ligands that did, uh, did come in the vicinity of these probes, we actually ended up with probes that were specific for this subpocket. So we repeated this for each individual subpocket, and now we have representative probes in 3D to annotate which subpockets are actually targeted by each ligand. And so this is repeated every time when a new ligand or crystal structure is added to the glyph database. There are also several structural annotations in glyphs, and I won't go into all of them. But one that I want to highlight is um, the G rich loop. So the G rich loop is the loop here at the top. It's also called the P loop. And um, this one is uh, quite flexible. So at the top, you see here that we have a closed uh, loop formation, whereas here at the bottom, we have an open loop formation. Um, and in order to capture this and quantify this, we went back to our residue numbering scheme and came up with ref and reference points of the, the, um, uh, for these, uh, these movements and actually uh, were able to uh, identify reference points so that we can calculate the rotation of the Gearwich loop and also the opening of the Gearwich loop and the, length and, and the angle, so the distance, uh, the, the angle and the distance between the catalytic loop and the geometric loop. So that gave us some insights into the variability also. So this is an overview of all the structures that we had in clips. So we have the rotation here. So it really moves all over the place. And also uh, it opens up and closes quite a bit. One of the latest, <coughs> sorry, one of the latest additions to um, the Glyphs database are uh, drugs and clinical inhibitors. So from the Bonnet lab, um, we, uh, they have generated uh, this uh, PKI database, uh, which annotates also these drugs and cl clinical inhibitors. So we take their and took their information um, and uh, we did a bit of uh, curation and now added to the Glyphs database and from there, it is now possible to click quickly and go from a, a specific drug, search for a specific drug and find kinase drug complexes or find analogs of uh, that are um, actually crystallized and also to uh, find uh, bioactivity data. So now I'm going to give you a quick demo of a website. Um, so this is uh, the Cliffs uh, website at the moment. Um, this is the main page. Here you see the whole kinome and all the uh, kinases in red are the ones that uh, actually have crystal structures. And the ones in green are the ones that um, have gotten new crystal structures in the latest release. So every week the database is updated. And also this evening Cliffs will be updated again. So let's take a look at the drugs. Uh, at the drug page, uh, we see the different drugs. And if you hover over it, you can also see the chemical structure of the drugs. So um, we have the links here with uh, Cliffs, so you can quickly see if there are structures available in Cliffs for this particular drug or not. And um, if you click on this, uh, the show bioactivity data button, it also collects uh, all the available kinase uh, activity data that is available. And you can also directly go from here to Campbell from where this is actually collected. Um, if we sort by approval year, for example, we see several uh, drugs that have been approved last year uh, that actually do not yet have a crystal structure available. But in that case, we can uh, find structures with analogs of uh, these, uh, these drugs. So now we did a search for capmatinib. And here at the top, we see that we found the best hit and it has a Morgan fingerprint similarity of 0.54. So that's quite good. And also if we hover here over the ligand, we see that it's indeed quite a close match between uh, the drug and the ligand in the structure. 
So let's uh, take a look. At this page, you get the information about uh, the whole structure. So we have some general information about the structure itself and the kinase, and also the information about the different conformations that are within the kinase structure. And also something about the quality uh, according to glyphs uh, based on uh, residues and the completeness and atoms and potential missing atoms and the way it was uh, properly aligned in glyphs. Uh, here you can download them in uh, different formats, the structure that have been prepared by glyphs, or you can directly download the final session. Um, here we have the NGL viewer, so you can directly view the structure in NGL and also the glyphs numbering is shown here in combination with the normal residue numbering and also some pre-generated uh, 2D um, uh, images are shown here. So you can quickly explore how the inhibitor actually binds to the pocket. Um, also different uh, cluster waters are analyzed, uh, here it's only one. And then it's also checked how it interacts with the protein and or the ligand. Uh, in this case, we see that um, uh, the uniprot uh, pocket sequence is the same uh, for this uh, uh, structure as well as the sequence. There are no mutations, otherwise it's added here. And on the, under orthosteric ligand, we get a bit more information about the ligand itself. So we have here the, the orthosteric ligand you can find analogs of the ligand. And here you get a schematic overview of how it interacts with the different residues and what interaction types are done. Uh, the main pockets that are targeted are uh, not a lot for this ligand, but uh, it's actually interacting in the main pocket and targets one specific sub pocket in the main pocket. This is the full uh, kinase ligand overview. Uh, so we have the interactions with all the 85 uh, residues. And we can, for example, see that with uh, the aspartate, we have a hydrophobic contact, but also a hydrogen bond interaction. And uh, at the bottom, we have uh, binding affinities that are extracted from Campbell. Uh, between these ligands and in bed is the one in complex with uh, the current uh, uh, protein. So it's a MET uh, protein. Um, if we want to explore a bit more, and, and take a look, for example, at the interaction patterns and try to identify other uh, kinase uh, ligand structures that have a similar interaction pattern, we can go from here. And then it will compare all the interaction finger, uh, fingerprints and see, uh, try to find uh, other structures uh, that have similar interactions and, uh, uh, but uh, probably or possibly also different inhibitors, because uh, that way you can also you know, find other inhibitors that are structurally dissimilar, uh, but they can have similar interactions within the pocket. So there are potential off targets, for example. Um, at the bottom, after each search, you can download uh, the information or show it on Kynome. And uh, you can also download the all the structures form from all complexes in uh, PDB format, MOL2, and as an MOE database. Um, from here, you can uh, also select structures that are the most interesting to you and collect them under your favorites. They're then uh, shown in this overview. And uh, of course, we also have a search option uh, that allows you to actually uh, search within every different variable that is uh, available in glyphs. And uh, you can also do similarity searches, dissimilarity searches, substructure searches uh, uh, by just drawing the ligand here. Um, and last but not least, I just want to highlight that uh, we now also have an API. And I'm happy to actually report that um, uh, since our uh, latest release, we see that a lot of people picked up on this uh, because right now our server is processing uh, uh, about 100,000 requests every month. So uh, that uh, picked up nicely. So that was a quick demo. Um, now uh, back to what you can also do with glyphs. So the current structural coverage is shown here. So this is the difference between the structural coverage from 2015 and uh, the current uh, structural coverage. So for example, if we want to compare uh, all the available 
inhibitors uh, present in glyphs with all the kinase inhibitors that are present in Campbell, uh, we can do that. And this is also, in this case, made uh, possible via NIME uh, because we also have glyphs NIME nodes. Um, from Campbell, we extracted more than 110,000 uh, uh, different kinase inhibitors. And uh, then in NIME, we did a similarity search and actually found that uh, for most of the different kinases and most of the, uh, of the inhibitors, we have a good uh, representation of analogs in glyphs. So for most uh, kinase inhibitors in Campbell, we also have an analog present at least in Campbell. For 60% overall, we find that um, there is a similar ligand if we take an ECFP4 uh, fingerprint and a similarity of 0 0.4. Of course, there are many more different options. I just want to highlight one a recent one from the Bayerat group. Um, they analyzed, uh, they use uh, clips also to collect uh, different crystal structures and they use more resources and then analyze allosteric inhibitors and then they cluster them together. And actually, this is also nicely in line with what we um, showed um, a while ago and uh, that you indeed have all these different uh, clusters of allosteric kinase inhibitors. And that's all possible because you have all the kinases are pre-aligned in glyphs. So if you download them and extract the allosteric ligands, well, they are already pre-extracted, then uh, you can as already see them all pre-clustered here. Another um, example of how to apply glyphs in a more mathematics set setting is um, by fragmenting the different ligands in uh, glyphs. So what we did is we fragmented all the different uh, ligands in 3D and then try to find uh, different fragments uh, of a drug that were, uh, that were all already available before the crystal structure of the drug came out. So in this case, ponatinib, the ponatinib drug uh, uh, structure came out in 2009 and we found three different crystal structures with fragments uh, that are also represented in ponatinib. And if we align, uh, if we use the glyphs alignment and overlay the fragments with the published ponatinib stru structure, we can see that the fragments indeed nicely also align with uh, ponatinib itself. So there is some conservation and also knowledge that we can reuse. And actually the Volkamer lab, so Andrea and Dominique, they worked on this uh, great library. So the Kinfrag library, and they use glyphs and they defined within the binding site different pockets, similar a bit to what we did with the sub pockets. Then they fragmented all the ligands and they assigned each fragment to one of these uh, sub pockets based on its vicinity. And then uh, they end, ended up with this fragment library. So from this fragment library, that's already 3D uh, in, uh, informed because they know where you bind it. They uh, and they selected a substructure, uh, a subset, and then they recombined this in a combinatorial library of 6.7 million um, new potential kinase inhibitors. And 99% of them were also uh, chemically uh, new. Uh, so they were not represented in uh, Campbell before. So that's a very cool resource. Also check out uh, their GitHub. Um, one last a uh, thing that I want to highlight that's an upcoming feature in uh, Clips is the kinase profiler. And kinase inhibitors quite commonly have um, a profiling of uh, inhibitors uh, of, of multiple uh, uh, kinases. And we can use this actually for much more than to see if a, uh, if a kinase um, has affinity for a specific inhibitor or not. And by in, in uploading this data or, well, adding this, uh, giving this to uh, the CLIFS profiler, it uh, allows you to specify two groups. So, for example, a group of actives and a group of inactives, depending on the affinity values. This group is then used to create a profile for each of the residues to see if there is a pattern between the, uh, the presence of a specific residue at a specific point and also um, 
um, to see if there's a higher or lower abundance uh, for the actives compared to the inactives. So then you get a profile like this, and this is both based for residue specific, but also property based residue groups. This information is then used for uh, data mining. Uh, it's a light data mining in JavaScript. Uh, and in your browser, it will try to find a pattern that is uh, most distinguishing between the active set and the inactive set. Uh, and in this case, for example, it comes up with two residue positions and it finds that if the gatekeeper 45 is not a methionine and the hinge uh, 47 residue is a leucine, that you have quite a good enrichment of the active uh, kinases versus all the inactive kinases. And that also makes sense if we look at the structure of this uh, BOK inhibitor, because these residues are definitely in close contact uh, with uh, the BI inhibitor. So a few more things to highlight that are along the way, on the way are the, this profiler. And we also want to enable a dynamic sequence alignments on the website, um, additional uh, creation of an additional coloring scheme uh, on the website. Uh, we're working on improving the totemer and protonation handling in uh, cliffs, and uh, we are actually fully revising the reference uh, alignment behind cliffs. And uh, last but not least, uh, a new DFG classifier will be released soon because with a few thousand additional structures, we have some new insights and new variability within the DFG region. And uh, also the hydrophobic spine annotation will be uh, uh, added to clips. So uh, with that, I would just want to acknowledge um, everybody who's uh, been involved in clips uh, in one way or another. And especially I want to highlight George, Oscar and Chris. And um, uh, of course, also all the different tools and uh, software uh, that we use in clips to actually put this all together. Um, last but not least, also thanks to you and all the Cliff users. Uh, for providing us with feedback and, uh, and uh, that's uh, very valuable for us. So thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Fantastic. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Albert, uh, for your presentation. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, feel free to either type them or uh, raise your hand. Uh, we'll start with the first question, but uh, feel free to ask questions afterwards as well, um, because there are none uh, right now. Uh, Albert, one question. You had the kinase profiler, right? Uh, so yeah. in this case, uh, you have bioactivity data um, and you then have a given ligand, right? And you get information from the kinase side. But in practice, of course, yeah, if you want to design out promiscuity or so between kinases, right? The question is for what should I change about the ligand? Um, in principle, you can invert uh, your kinase profiler, right? And go for the yeah. question, um, so what do I need to change about my ligand structure, right? Uh, to design out the uh, promiscuity. Is there, do you think about inverting that as well? So you can basically get information about how to change your ligand, because in principle you can, right, based on the data you have. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's uh, a good question. So actually it is possible just to toggle uh, which is the most relevant uh, option for you. So if you want to design out some elements or if you want to design in, uh, or just want to understand what drives uh, one thing. So in this case, it's uh, activity data, but it can also just be based on uh, label data. So if you have two labels, that would also work. Uh, and then uh, you can also, um, uh, and also the, the ligand information the and the chemical structure of it, uh, of the ligand is not, uh, is not necessary for the profiler. So if you just want to see uh, what would uh, give you the most enrichment between two sets of kinases, you can also just put in that data without any bioactivity data, and then it would also create these profiles for you. I find the most interesting residues to target within your protein uh, drug design. Mm. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, yeah, this one, uh, thank you from Ramesh, uh, much appreciated. So Albert, uh, thank you for providing that first of all. And GJ uh, has a question as well. Um, is it, if you don't mind, do we have a microphone um, so you can ask the question orally? Um, hi, uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, CLIFs uh, have API also, uh, you have NIME integration. 
So I wonder that, uh, you know, if we want to do the machine learning study, use your data, uh, can we extract all the annotation data from your database? Is there a way we can do that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, for your comment. Um, the, the API is actually used also by the Glyphs 9 nodes. Um, and for that, I want to uh, refer you to the 3D ECAM uh, website and also the 3D ECAM um, uh, project, because in that we uh, also generated different workflows and that highlight how to extract all the data from uh, Glyphs. And we have example workflows for that. Um, uh, but all the information uh, that is presented in Cliffs is indeed also available via the API. So you can just uh, extract everything that is relevant to you and integrate it uh, for your machine learning. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, please otherwise uh, send me an email uh, directly or at info at cliffs.net and uh, I can uh, provide you with additional information about this as well. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, cheers for your question. And Ramesh, uh, you have a follow-up question as well? Yeah, so um, and the question is, in the summary page that you present for a given structure, it would be informative to mention the orientation of the hydrophobic spine. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, I agree. And that's also definitely long overdue. Uh, so that's also one of the last points of our ro roadmap. We plan on integrating this annotation uh, soon. Um, well, soon it, it will still be some time, but um, uh, I will try to add it as quickly as possible. So uh, uh, please bear in mind, this is primarily a, a, a hobby project that I do, and I don't focus on this during my daily, uh, uh, daily research. Uh, so everything that I do is during the weekend and uh, and in my free time. So it might not be as quickly as uh, as uh, in a normal research project, uh, but uh, I will try to incorporate it as quickly as possible. Yes. Okay, because it's uh, Albert, because you, I thought you were starting your group in Copenhagen, and it's one of your main projects. But that's your weekend and uh, evening project, yeah? Or yeah. So actually, um, uh, what I also uh, want to highlight here is uh, right now I haven't started my own uh, group uh, yet. I'm in the group of uh, David uh, Glorium and I'm actually the lead developer of the GPSR uh, database. So if you have any questions about GPSRs or the GPSR database, also feel free to uh, uh, ask them to me during uh, the, the, the drink afterwards. Uh, but, uh, but I hope indeed to acquire some funding and I'm working on that uh, to also put more time and effort into Eclipse, yes. Excellent. And let's do one uh, final question as well from uh, David Machals. If you have a, a, a microphone, otherwise I can read the question as well. David, okay. is it possible for you to, to ask a question? Um, yeah, so thank you, Albert, for this nice talk. And I was especially interested on um, how you're planning to improve the Tartomere and protonation handling, since it's a very um, general problem, I would say. So be interested about your thoughts there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, that's uh, indeed a, a very uh, general problem. So one uh, thing that we uh, that we now did was uh, we processed uh, the PDB structures. Then we looked at the ligand dictionary from uh, the EMBI, and then we incorporated. Well, we updated all the atom types and the, the bond types if they did not match uh, correctly. Um, that said, uh, in, in some cases, also the EMBL, EBI, uh, and, and the ligand dictionary is not always correct. So for example, in these cases, the, the chemical component dictionary also contains errors. So we also have a curated uh, reference set of uh, some of these uh, inhibitors. But we, what we try to do is actually along the same lines of what they did for the SCPDB in which they fragmented. Uh, the ligand. So we try to create this uh, reference set of uh, curated ligands and then use graph uh, matching of the, the curated ligand against the ligand in the structure and then update the atom types and bond types. Yeah, thank you, Albert. And yeah, let's actually do a, 
uh, let's do one more question because that's a bit forward looking uh, by Chris de Graaf. Um, Chris, do you want to ask? Thanks, Andres. Uh, so thanks, Albert, for the nice overview. So you, so you mentioned a couple of interesting um, uh, kinase inhibitor design applications of CLIFs, like the kin frac lip uh, approach uh, by Andrea Volkheimer and Lab. And also there have been publications of inhibitor design workflows described by, by Janssen, for example. Uh, but, in, but in European, are there any applications that, that would be very interesting, but are not, are not yet uh, fully explored? Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a difficult one because there, I think, uh, with the data set that we have and the possibilities that you have, it's, uh, there are a lot of different opportunities. Um, but what I was also thinking about is that if uh, you fragment uh, the different ligands and also enrich it with the different uh, bioactivity data and the glyphs and the switches that you have, you can also integrate that information into the different fragments. And that way uh, you can sort of um, uh, um, incorporate selectivity data while you're assembling uh, uh, your uh, combinatorial library of, uh, based on fragments. But that's just uh, one one ID. Great, thanks. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's close uh, close this presentation, please. Uh, thanks a lot, Albert. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. Cheers. Um, yeah, let's move on to the second presentation then uh, by Andrew Henry, and that's on reverse fingerprinting. Andrew. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, so from here so I can see what's going on. So I'm Andrew Henry from the Cambridge Office nominee of the uh, chemical, chemical Computing Group. I'm going to talk about reverse fingerprinting and using this to map structural motifs to activity. So uh, molecular fingerprints and specifically feature list fingerprints. Uh, these take a molecule and annotate information onto them. Reverse fingerprinting then takes the fingerprint annotations and maps them back onto molecules with a method that we call MIBLES. I'm going to show some examples of this approach uh, to find uh, pharmacophores and toxicophores. Then how can we use reverse fingerprints to take a series of ligands and label atoms with their contribution to an activity? Molecular fingerprints are a way to describe a molecule. Many fingerprint schemes uh, have a list of individual features like a hydrobond acceptor or donor, or where there's a particular functional group. So here there's a halogen atom or a methyl sulfonamide. You can then store that information as a list of integer numbers. Do I see this uh, particular property or not? The fingerprint for the molecule could then be a list of the features that it matches. With some fingerprints, there isn't a direct matching between the fingerprints and the atoms in the final molecule. For example, in Mo, uh, we have some shape fingerprints, which take a molecule, a calculated distance matrix, and then encode the eigenvalues of that distance matrix into a spectrum. And you can't revert, go from that spectrum back to the underlying atoms. So these are some different ways to define fingerprint bits. Uh, max keys have a list of functional groups and bonding patterns, and then score when they're present or absent. Uh, a fingerprint feature could also be a combination of annotations. For example, uh, we've got some triangles. Uh, here, there's an aromatic ring near a donor and some acceptors. Uh, we can then uh, measure the distance between these annotations, uh, either by just counting the number of bonds between them uh, through the graph distance, or by measuring the distance in the 3D conformation. Obviously, that then means you need 3D ligand conformations afterwards. And you can store these distances uh, either explicitly or as binned values if you need to uh, group uh, diff several distances into ranges. Extended connectivity fingerprint score, which features are seen in shells uh, through the bond graph around a central atom. And the number uh, refers to the diameter of these shells. For instance, the FCFP6 fingerprint has three concentric circles, so a diameter of, uh, of six bonds. Feature list fingerprints are easy to create. Uh, they could encode substructures or interactions. You could have single annotations or combine them in patterns. You can also use uh, individual fingerprint bits as a descriptor in a QSAR model. When you write a fingerprint in the SVL language, you can then uh, load it up and use it in all the fingerprint applications in Mo for similarity searching, clustering, or uh, diversity analysis. And when you've got a fingerprint list fingerprint, you can uh, 
reverse these bits. If you find bits which correlate with an interesting activity, you can map those back onto the atoms that they came from. This is, of course, not possible when the fingerprint loses the connection between the fingerprint bit and the atom the source atoms. So this brings us to the main topic of the talk, which is reverse fingerprinting. Uh, when bits can be mapped back to their original atoms, we can produce atom scores for the contribution to an activity. And this not, isn't a new approach. Many people have done this over the years, and some of them are listed here. Uh, I'm going to talk about a method uh, from my colleague Chris Williams, which is called MIBLES. It was published in 2009 and uses mutual information theory. So MIBLES stands for Mutual Information Based Activity Labels and Scores. Uh, the mutual information between a bit state K and an activity state A is described with this equation. It's a lot like a Shannon entropy. It's also uh, called a cross entropy or transient information. And it's been used for feature selection uh, in QSAR and to characterize uh, part uh, partition property spaces. In the simplest case, uh, if you have a feature which is present or absent and a binary activity, uh, but the same approach works when you've got multiple bit states and multiple activities. So the way it works, uh, if you have no correlation between the fingerprint bit and the activity, uh, the combined probability is the same as the independent probabilities. This term in the equation goes to one, uh, you take a log of it, and then the information, mutual information goes to zero. So to focus on a specific case, if we had a fingerprint bit that is either present or absent uh, and uh, activity that was uh, uh, either active or inactive, we get these equations for the true positives, the true negatives, the false negatives and the false positives. Uh, the top two are the uh, uh, affirmative terms where we, uh, the fingerprint is tracking with the activity. The bottom two are dismissive terms where the fingerprint uh, bit tracks with inactivity. We then make a bit score uh, where we sum up the affirmative terms and subtract uh, the dismissive terms. Uh, the SK is the score of the true positives and true negatives minus the false positives and the false negatives. We can then take a set of active compounds and score how often a fingerprint bit is found in these active and inactive uh, compounds. We can then take a molecule score by adding uh, the SK scores for each fingerprint bit uh, that's seen in the molecule and then we can get an atomic activity score SA by counting the contribution of each atom into those uh, bit scores. We can normalize these. So we go through the whole training database, uh, find the uh, maximum atom score, invert that and call it Z, multiply all the atom scores for that. So now the maximum atom score will be one. Then the molecule score is a sum of those normalized bit scores. Uh, to visualize how the uh, uh, SK scores change, here's a plot with the bits sorted by the SK value. Uh, if you're in this corner of the plot, uh, positive bit scores shows that the bits are more frequent in the active molecules than inactives. Uh, in this corner, uh, they're more frequent in the inactive molecules. And if you're uh, around about zero, uh, then there's uh, found equally often in active or inactive molecules. And the convention that we're going to use for uh, annotating these scores on molecules, uh, if there's a positive SK score, then we'll show that with a solid sphere. And if there's a negative uh, score showing that it's uh, uh, found more of an inactive compound, it will have a wireframe sphere. And the radius of these spheres uh, is, uh, depends on the uh, value of the score. So in this case, uh, you can see we've got uh, an annotation of the sulfur being bad for activity. Uh, the uh, groups here are uh, when you have a, that particular match, then it's a, a solid sphere and it's, it's a, uh, good for the activity. So here's the workflow. Uh, we take a training database uh, with the molecules that have either been classified as active or inactive. Uh, we build the reverse fingerprint models and then we can use that to label atoms onto the ligands. Uh, we could also run uh, these calculations on a whole set of compounds. Uh, I won't go into that today, so this section is grayed out. So as an example, here are two molecules. Uh, to see what's similar uh, between the molecules, we can set them both as being active. To see the differences, we could set one as active and one as inactive. So this uh, annotates uh, what we get from our reverse fingerprint models with max keys when both molecules are active. Uh, there are solid gray spheres, and they show the groups that are common to both molecules, uh, common in the uh, description of the molecule with the max keys. Instead, if we move the activity threshold so that now one is active and the other is inactive, 
uh, what happens is now the groups that are found in both molecules are not annotated at all. So the, this side of the molecule no longer has any spheres on it. Uh, the rest of the active molecule groups that are found uh, in the active molecule that are not in the inactive one uh, have a solid uh, uh, sphere. Things that are found only in the inactive molecules have a, a wireframe sphere. So what does the picture look like if we use some different fingerprints? Well, this takes the same example uh, using the FP FCFP6 extended connectivity fingerprint uh, and to the 2D PCH1 to the right. Um, the FCFP6 scores highlight the differences, uh, but it, the pattern is diff looks different to the one that we got with the max keys. Um, the PCH scheme is using triangles of typed atoms. So these are things like uh, hydrogen donors, hydrophobes, or aromatic rings. Both of the sch schemes are picking up uh, that there's something has changed uh, to the right side of this molecule. Uh, the scores are higher with the FCFP scheme uh, as there are bits for each of these at uh, aromatic atoms. Uh, in the PCH scheme, uh, there's an uh, a definition of an aromatic ring centroid. So that uh, fingerprint bit gets spread over all of the atoms within that ring. So the individual scores end up being lower than they would be uh, with the FCFP uh, scheme. Now I'm going to give some more examples uh, of how we could use this application. Uh, first, to identify some toxic fours in insecticides. Second, to find pharmacophores in active ligands, and then color up some atoms uh, according to the contribution to activity in a congeneric series of molecules. This example is from Rocky Goldsmith, who's now at the EPA. Uh, he took a set of 80 pyrethroid insecticides. Uh, he collected them from PubMed abstracts using this Excel macro. It's available on the EPA website. Uh, the activity score we use is the acaricide insect versus tick endpoint. Uh, so this selects compounds which kill mites but not bees. For this set of compounds, we train models on the max keys on the acaricide activity. Uh, typically, these have alpha uh, cyano groups, which get uh, highlighted with these solid gray spheres uh, in this annotation of the fingerprint models. Uh, conversely, the insecticides that are in, inactive as acaricides that don't uh, hit the mites have no uh, alpha substituent to this uh, next to this ring. You can see the uh, Annotations uh, for the next, uh, when we look at those molecules with both the FCFP and the PCH scheme. Um, this, broadly, they're, they're, they're similar. Uh, there are big scores again with the FCFP scheme with these aromatic atoms to, uh, to the right side. Uh, there's some sort of annotation in the PCH scheme, but the, the individual scores are, are lower. We can also see uh, the inactive compounds have this uh, cyclopropyl ring. Uh, which uh, isn't found in the, uh, the active molecules. Again, uh, we're annotating this nitrile group, uh, and there's uh, also uh, uh, common features found about that. Next, the goal was to find some compounds which were selective for the varroa mite, but not for bees. So Rocky took a set of uh, max key fingerprint models and scored 14 acaricides. And the compounds with the highest uh, SM score uh, were for these forms of fluvarinate. Uh, the high scoring compounds uh, have a few of these red spheres annotated, uh, you can see around the structure. Uh, and fluvarinate is used by bee beekeepers to control mites. Now to identify pharmacophore motifs, we use a similar workflow. We need a set of active uh, and or inactive compounds. Uh, I'm going to show uh, using the same three fingerprints on a set of 2D conformations of uh, where all the compounds are active. We can then map those scores onto a representative 3D ligand in a PDB structure uh, to see if it's picking up the, the uh, important interactions. Uh, this could show us if we can uh, find frameworks uh, for motifs without knowing the uh, complex uh, structure, just from taking a set of active uh, compounds. So here we took 165 uh, PD4 compounds. Uh, we treated them all as active and built models. And this compares the scores mapped onto the 3D structure of Rolipram. Uh, you see uh, the different results when we use different fingerprints. Uh, so the max keys uh, finds these ether oxygens as being important. And there's also a very big score on this NH group to the left-hand side. The FCFP scheme has the big scores on the aromatic atoms. 
the 2D PCH scheme uh, again picks up this distant pharmacophore between the uh, ether oxygens and the uh, uh, acceptor on the far uh, left side. This example is an EGFR kinase uh, using 135 active compounds uh, and the same approach. Uh, these are then mapped onto the structure of lipitinib from 1XKK. In all the cases, the atom scores highlight the quinazoline core and the uh, uh, nitrogen at, at the top. Uh, these are found in lots of the compounds and all the schemes annotate aromaticity, acceptors and donors. So it's uh, not surprising you do that. Again, the FCFP6 has strong scores for these aromatic atoms. Um, a lot of these distant, more distant features have weaker scores. Uh, there's more variation in the set of ligands between these, so there's not such a strong signal for those. This is an example using factor 10A. Uh, the sample crystal structure is 1FAX. There are 117 actives in this case. Uh, the max keys and the 2 dpch uh, to the left and to the right uh, pick out the pharmacophore with cationic groups at either end of the molecule. Uh, the FPFC, FCFP6 doesn't get this as strongly. Uh, the reason for this, we think, is uh, the interactions are only being scored uh, up to a diameter of uh, six bonds. Uh, the max key also finds this uh, acid group in the middle between these two uh, cations. Uh, 2DPCH scheme also picks up some scores of the naphthal ring in the middle of the ligand. This is a lick kinase uh, where we have 42 actives. Uh, the reverse fingerprint models uh, with the max keys find the amino pyrimidine. Uh, this is interacting with the hinge. Uh, it also finds this uh, pyrazole group, which isn't. Uh, this is because these groups are identical uh, chemically for, for the, uh, in terms of the max key. It uh, encodes these as nitrogens double bonded to carbons. Uh, the FCFP6 uh, does a bit better uh, here because it's finding these connected rings. Uh, the 2D PCH scheme uh, completely fails. Uh, it's because the data set uh, has actives that re really don't look much like this molecule. Uh, they, most of them have a pyrimidine ring, but they're much longer extended molecules, a bit like Gleevec. It means the PCH model that we, we end up with is looking for extended triangles, and they don't match this uh, uh, smaller ligand here. So this shows that uh, not one fingerprint is going to work the best in all the different cases. So to summarize, reverse fingerprint models can identify from, uh, toxicophore motifs, uh, things that are important for selectivity and pharmacophore motifs uh, for what's making key interactions with the receptor. Uh, it's no surprise uh, as the data sets and congeneric series where common cores tend to maintain the same types of interactions. Uh, but no single fingerprint scheme works the best. In the future, we're gonna look at combining scores for consensus predictions, perhaps to get more robust predictions. Now I'll talk about labeling atomic contributions to activity. We want to identify atoms that contribute or diminish activity in a chemical series. We create reverse fingerprint models at different activity thresholds and use some coloring to annotate these. We use a DHFR set, uh, which has a wide range of activities. The molecules share, share a diamino pyrimidine uh, ring. A uh, second fused ring can have five or six atoms, uh, with six membered being the best uh, for activity. Uh, there's bulk to the right hand side and ideally an N methyl group at the top. Uh, we picked this out using our mosaic tool. Uh, can we find the same kind of information, but by labeling with the reverse fingerprint scores? So uh, in this case, these are uh, four candidate ligands uh, from this data set. Uh, the one at the top is uh, active. Uh, it's exactly the same as the one at the bottom with the difference that uh, well, there's an NH group here and an N methyl group in this one. Uh, you see they all share this uh, amino pyrimidine group to the left side uh, and that gets picked up by all the different fingerprint schemes uh, when we uh, annotate uh, and saying that all these molecules are active. So that's effectively finding the common substructure between each of these. Uh, Next, if we uh, adjust the activity threshold, so now uh, things with PIC50 uh, greater than six are, are active, uh, we get different annotations. So all this annotation around the amino pyrimidine group uh, disappears because uh, it's found equally in the actives and inactives. Instead, what we see are the uh, annotations on the things that seem to be uh, overrepresented in the active molecules. So you see uh, there's an annotation with a, 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 a wireframe sphere on this sulfur in this uh, five-membered ring, uh, and that's annotated as being bad for ac activity. Uh, you also see there's annotations on this uh, uh, N-methyl group, 
uh, and also on this alkyl group in this linker chain. What's, uh, what you find is that the, when you have these substituents, it uh, modifies the orientation of uh, the angle between these two rings, uh, and, and that uh, is assumed to change the activity. Next, uh, we're going to take uh, show scores combined for th uh, different thresholds all in one scheme. Uh, so here we've got uh, four different models uh, set at a threshold of zero, so everything's active, four, six, and, and 7.5. So again, uh, when the threshold is zero, you're seeing these uh, amino pyrimidine groups being annotated. Uh, when the uh, threshold is four, then you see these annotations in red. Uh, it picks out that bulk to the right-hand side of these rings is good, and that's uh, found in most of the schemes, especially the max keys, a little bit in the uh, FCFP uh, scheme, not so much in the uh, PCH one. Uh, at, when the threshold is six, now uh, the max keys are picking out that this uh, alkyl group here is particularly good for activity. Um, some other groups are being annotated around here with the, the, the other groups. Uh, and when the threshold is much higher, then this picks out that this N-methyl group is particularly strong uh, for, for, for the activity with the max keys. So this shows what happens if we combine the scores from different fingerprints. This is using the three fingerprints from before, but also uh, additionally the type graph triangles uh, and the uh, GPI uh, DAPH fingerprints. Uh, and it's essentially getting the same types of information, but a single view. Uh, so combining the fingerprints smooths out the inconsistencies between the different things. So to summarize, uh, the atom scores from reverse fingerprint models identify ligand pharmacophores and toxicophores. You could use this to build a pharmacophore query. Uh, you could uh, use the atom scores to describe the similarity, perhaps for uh, flexible alignment. Uh, reverse fingerprint models seem to be able to capture the uh, activity within a kind of generic series. Uh, you could perhaps use this to summarize known SARs uh, and score uh, use the scores to guide ligand design. These are shown with a question mark. Uh, perhaps uh, we'll see how well this works in, in practice. Uh, the tool is available from the SVL exchange. Uh, the URL is there. You can download it. There are the, all these examples and some documentation to work with that. And this is aimed, uh, we're aiming to, to uh, develop th this area. Uh, we have some additional talks and uh, developments planned for this. So thanks for that and uh, be happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Andrew. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for your contribution. Um, right now, there are no questions in the chat, uh, but feel free to uh, type or raise your hand. Um, I, I'll start with the first comment. I'm quite amazed that the max keys were, at least in some cases, uh, reasonably useful, yeah, because it's quite a crude tool, right? It's quite a short key set. It was originally made for lookup, you know, cataloging molecules, basically, right? Yeah, um, I find that quite amazing. Also, in well, similarity searching, it somehow still works, yeah, although it's quite crude, right? Wow, it's quite amazing. It's, it, it depends, you know, if uh, it depends on the question that you're asking and um, uh, if uh, the types of information that it's it's encoding describes enough of any information that you have, well, then, yeah, it'll, it'll work fine. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. The other uh, comment I would like to make is uh, mutual information uh, you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. I used it as well to select features at some stage of my PhD. And what I really discovered is um, you have to be careful if you have uh, analogs in your data set, for example, right? Generally, if you select features, right? Because then you think you have more evidence than you actually have. And um, the other parts are, it's difficult to have a gut feeling for how it behaves with respect to feature frequency, because most features are rare, uh, as well as unbalanced data set sizes. Yeah? Um, so if you have uh, whatever, actives are also rare, right? So if you have 1% of actives and you have uh, features that are rare, that are responsible for activity, mutual information is like entropy, right? So yeah. if you have the uh, data sets of the same size and features that are present in 50% of the cases, the whole thing behaves symmetrically, right? But that's not the case if you have few actives or rare features. And for me, it's difficult to quantify that um, emotionally, so to speak, in my gut, yeah? Uh, things like positive predictive value or LR plus, likelihood ratio plus, yeah? I find that easier to understand. The mutual information I find tricky yeah, to get a feeling for how that behaves when it comes to biased data sets. Yeah. That's my personal uh, learning from that. Yeah. Yes, so one thing uh, would be to have some really simple, um, you know, like your fingerprints of heavy atom count. Uh, and if you can model your, your, your activities with that, then any of the fancy stuff uh, isn't really required if uh, mm -hmm. the, the 
the description needs to be accurate enough to get the to, to be able to describe what, what you see and if you have a really fancy uh, descriptor after that probably you're, you're just fitting into the noise rather than uh, uh, getting it yeah that would be a trick yeah that, that's right yeah, yeah. let's see uh, yeah Raphael says very nice were the works presented already published uh, not yet I mean uh, we've got this uh, the original publication in the 2000, there were a couple of papers uh, uh, in the 2000s, uh, which were talking about the method. Uh, the application, the, the recent work is that there's a, a nicer GUI panel to uh, group this all together. We've had a couple of uh, more uh, talks prepared, uh, which are available as webinars, uh, going into more practical details of, of this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm sure at some point we're, we're going to be publishing things as well, but uh, at the moment it's it's in a PDF on the uh, uh, from the SVL Exchange or uh, a couple of extra talks are uh, available on on uh, some of the further uses of this. Oh, great. Okay. Are there any other questions for Andrew? If so, feel free to ask them now. Okay. Yeah. It okay. doesn't seem like that. Then uh, thanks a lot, Andrew. Thanks a lot for your contribution. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, third A today. So that's Alex Clark, uh, who will talk about uh, a very tricky topic, especially if you store them in databases, mixtures of compounds. Yeah? How do you represent them? How do you store them? And so on. Alex, thank you for joining us today. All right, that's maximizing. Okay, so yeah, um, I'm gonna be talking about how we've been working recently to um, level up the uh, ability to represent mixtures of chemicals so that we can do the same kinds of techniques that we've been doing with um, chem informatics for our single structures. So uh, one of the uh, nice things about having a chem informatics audience is I don't have to spend too much time on the introduction. We all understand the value proposition of taking chemical data and um, uh, representing it in connection table form along with its properties so we can do all kinds of fun and interesting things and this has been going on for decades been very successful um, mainly in the uh, small molecule drug discovery industry but some other places as well nonetheless uh, whenever we're talking about chemicals in actual reality it's pretty much always uh, more accurate to describe it as a mixture of substances there's always some kind of impurities or solvents or various other things going on and it can get pretty complicated and the, there's a kind of a very odd conspicuous absence. There really are no um, common formats or large databases of interchangeable information that's machine readable in the mixtures area. So we set out to change that. And by we, I mean uh, myself and my colleagues at Collaborative Drug Discovery, as well as the uh, fine folks at IUPAC and the NG Trust, particularly Leah McEwen, who got this, the ball rolling on all of this stuff. Uh, so, Essentially, what we've done is we've looked at what's been done with a single molecule. So the mole file standard has been very successful. And we've proposed something which we're sort of slightly tongue in cheek calling a mix file. So it op operates in the same kind of space as, as a single um, structure, except it's for uh, uh, groups of structures. And also there's the uh, mixtures NG notation, which or Minchi for short, which is derived from the NG identifier, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, okay, so just a little note on uh, what goes into a mixture. Um, there are several uh, key conceptual ideas that you have to really keep in mind if you're designing one of these data structures. And the first one is that it has to be hierarchical. You can't just have a list of things because mixtures really very often contain mixtures as mixtures. And this, this is important information to record and has all kinds of nuance effects down the line. Uh, clearly, any uh, leaf node in this, this tree structure uh, should have a structure, when, uh, chemical structure, whenever possible. Um, that's obvious, but it means that we can, whenever we have this situation, we can apply all of the tools of cheminformatics that we've been working on for decades. Uh, whenever, whenever the information is available, we need to provide concentrations for each of the components, whether it's a, a terminal component or a branch. Um, and that, uh, whenever possible, caveat sort of leads into the last idea, and that any mixtures description has to have a high tolerance of uncertainty, because very often there's a, a great disparity in how well the components are defined. Some, often some parts will be very precisely spec'd out, we know exactly what it is, how much, et cetera, et cetera. And other parts will be very vague either because it's just unknown or unknowable, or maybe we just don't care and the information wasn't provided. So these are just kind of caveats that we have to keep in mind when we're actually designing use cases for these. 
Uh, so just a, a quick note on the actual formats themselves. Most of what I'm talking about is going to be in the more abstract sense. So I'm, I'm just going to assert that if we have the information in machine readable form, then all of the things I'm talking about worked is great. Um, but on the left, what I've shown there is a, a graphical rendition of, um, uh, of a lab reagent from the mix file format. So internally, it's a JSON based format. It's really, really simple. Um, by de trivial by design, as I like to say, because we want to encourage people to use it. We don't want to make it hard. Uh, so it's essentially a, a tree-like collection of mole files, concentration information, um, and any other data that you want to use to extend it. So the use case for this is kind of more like the ELN context, uh, same places where you'd sketch out a molecule, you'd save the CTAB information so you can recreate it, but you can also do operations on it with all of the chem informatics fun. Uh, and the other one is the Minchi notation, which is a very distilled down representation. So it's kind of similar to what is done with Inchi. It throws away a lot of information, but there, uh, uh, there's a huge positive to that because everything becomes much more standard and a lot of hard problems become easy. All right, so one of the big challenges when you define a new kind of data structure that, that's not really in general use at all is that you start with no data, no tools, no uh, applications, no customers, no nothing. So you have to build everything from the scratch, from scratch. And so the first thing that we did was simply just to enable the creation of data at all. Uh, and so on the left, bottom left there, I've shown a GitHub link. So uh, all of the core infrastructural work that I'm talking about is, is open source. And so if you go there, you'll find a toolkit that helps um, manipulate these mix files, even though they're very simple. Um, and there's also a nice uh, built-in editor. There is example data, there's documentation, there's links to a paper and several um, presentations. Um, and it's all cross compiled into JavaScript so you can run it on the desktop or embed it in a web page without having to do any um, complex server setup. So there's a lot of stuff there that you can have anytime you want. Uh, but on the other hand, I do work for a commercial company and we have a software as a service product which is called CDD Vault. And part of what we're doing on the commercial side is starting to integrate some of these tools into the, um, the value added product. And so now you can uh, basically, there are various ways of creating mix files, mixtures, and embedding them into the electronic lab notebook product. So it's displayed nicely as a pleasant graphical representation, uh, but internally it's stored as a machine readable description. It's just kind of like having a mole file inside your lab notebook. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff like you can stretch search for any of the components. Uh, we also have some really interesting machine learning tools for uh, unpacking uh, mixtures descriptions and from uh, short text descriptions. And that's another proprietary product that we can operate at scale. Okay, so uh, just a bit more um, information about these mixtures in the real world. Um, in lab chemistry, a lot of mixtures are really pretty simple, uh, but as we spread out to look at more and more scenarios, so formulations is a good um, adjacent industry. It's quite broadly defined. It includes uh, drug tablet pre preparation and a whole, whole host of consumer product types. And so in this example, I've just shown you a one example of a recipe of dishwashing liquid. Uh, so um, and what I want to draw attention to here is, is the specificity of the information varies quite considerably. So at the top, we've specified water, we've got the structure, the name, and a precise amount. So there's pretty much everything you need to know about that. Now, the next two components in the mixture are actually mixtures of mixtures. So we know how much we put in of that thing, but each of these is an aqueous solution in its, into itself. Now, as we go further down, you see the sodium chloride is in there. It, looks good, except there's no quantity information. So it would have been nice to have that, but it simply wasn't made available. And it's not a deal breaker. Uh, we know that the substance is in there, but we can't do any kind of analysis on the amount because it's just kind of implied to make up whatever is left in some ratio. Uh, underneath that, we have an example of um, a very common scenario once you leave the lab. Um, and it's when we, we have some biologically sourced component, in this case, coconut diethanolamide. Um, and we, we don't know exactly what the structures are. There's a whole bunch of things. We can't really enumerate them because we're not completely sure what they are. And if, if we were, it'd probably be a really long list. Um, and so what we can do instead is simply refer to these by authoritative identifiers like the INCI name or CAS numbers. And this is not very useful for from a chem informatics point of view, but it does give us some capabilities that we wouldn't have if we just described it by name. 
And then the last two entries are, from a software point of view, pretty useless. Um, it's, it's useful, it's good for a person, it's better than nothing. But if you're a computer algorithm, it's basically a placeholder. So we know there's a something else there, but there's not, not much we can do with it. So it is, it is what it is. Um, the mixture uh, data structure design is intended to extract as much value as you can from the information that you actually have, and no more, no less. Right, so just a note on uh, when it comes to representing structures in these components. Um, many times, e even if you go far away from chemistry, you'll still find some components where it's it's, it's easy to represent the thing as just a simple single structure, just in the way that we've been doing for decades. And so all of the tools that we have, it all works just great. Um, but then it gets it can get more difficult in a variety of different ways. And um, we, we can rise to the challenge or just let it, let it go. Uh, so for example, a lot of mixtures have polymers. And so perhaps somebody was kind enough to specify a repeat unit or a molecular weight distribution. And so with a bit of ex extra effort, you can do some kind of interpretation on that. Um, bottom left, there are some sometimes um, components that are more like ceramics where you've got some uh, lattice structure which you can't really draw as a mole file. I mean, you can try. Um, but you know, we can split the difference and just provide molecular formula information, for example. And then you've got things like biological products. Sometimes you know a certain amount about the structure, like say if you've mixed it with something that's just called starch. You can't draw starch. It's just, it's, you just can't do that. It's, it's a random collection of things. Um, but you, you can uh, assert that certain structural um, characteristics are there. So you could use, for example, use a structure ontology like the Kiwi to just uh, assert that there are certain components. So now you know something about it. Um, so I, I just put these examples in there is to just um, let you know that the, these are kind of edge cases at the moment that we're thinking about. We haven't exactly solved these problems, but we are thinking about the broader applicability of mixtures because it, it does it does go to some pretty weird cases and we can um, do some sensible things about it most of the time. All right, so um, whenever we're uh, pitching um, informatics stuff to the, the analog people and asking them to um, make a little bit of eff extra effort to expose their data in formats that we like, kind of have to sell them on what they get back out of it. And searching is usually a good one. Uh, because everybody is, knows what it's like to just go through stacks and stacks of papers looking for one specific thing. Uh, so just as a reasonably medium complex example, let, let's just pretend that I have um, a big database of thousands of consumer products all marked up in um, these mixtures formats. And I'm looking for certain characteristics and I don't want to read them all. And so for, in the query form on the left, just imagine that uh, you could imagine that this is a nice graphical user interface, but maybe for this audience, since that interface doesn't exist any more than the database, just pretend that it's a script. Just imagine we're coding something up simply in, in Python or whatever your um, choice of poison is. And so we, we can say that the first thing I want to, I want to make sure is that it has more than 40% water, just because that's what I want. And so we can just say it has to have one component with the exact structure of water, and at least one component, and they have to all add up to more than 40%. And then we can say that I, I want this um, natural product based on the coconut derivative, um, and it has to be referred to by its INCI name so we know it's legit. And then lastly, I don't want any phosphates in this um, surfactant. And so we can say it doesn't have the phosphate substructure. So these are all things that are very, very familiar to um, cheminformatic professionals. You can look through any of these three examples and go down and look to make sure these uh, criteria are met. Um, you know, the first the first two qualify. There's plenty of water, um, has the natural product referenced in the right way, and the first two don't have any phosphates, whereas the last one does, so it gets disqualified. Okay, so that's, that's an idea of what we can do uh, with the script, um, just going through a large collection of stuff, whether it's interactively or with some pre-programmed method. Now I just want to move on to some um, ideas that we can explore where we are actually doing something a bit more interesting with the results rather than rather than the deliverable, be, deliverable just being something that we look at. And so um, I actually uh, presented this example in a webinar that I co-presented a few months ago. So if you just make a note of the uh, link on the top right there, you'll get the, um, the full YouTube re um, uh, recording of the entire day. You can listen to it all or just fast forward to hour four, um, minute 13 and listen to our part. Uh, so the basic idea here is, um, many of you may be familiar with this one, a theophylline is a very useful drug that's often um, delivered as um, an, an aerosol. 
and it has some solubility issues. So the, the solvents that you want to fire up your nose are not necessarily the ones that it dissolves well in. So there's a certain amount of research trying to find combinations of, of less and pleasant solvents that, that um, get the drug to your, your system most quickly. And so what I did for this example is, is I found uh, four papers the hard way. And this is kind of simulating um, a utopian future where uh, essentially all literature uh, has every mixture that everyone ever describes abstracted in a um, fair, uh, fair data format like Mixfile or Minchi and stashed in a database somewhere that you personally have access to. I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, but in, in the absence of that, I was able to find four manually and uh, curate, cur curate each individual one. Um, so the, the first paper simply has um, six examples of theophylline dissolved in solvents. The second one has six more. Uh, the third one has a series of solvent concentrations. And the fourth one has the same kind of stuff, but slightly more diverse collection of solvents. Now, the, the idea here is um, hopefully you, you can already imagine, given the availability of a suitable data structure and, and a source, it, you could write a fairly simple script that goes through all of these um, potentially millions and or even billions of records and look for all of the ones that first of all they have the theophylline active ingredient and that's pretty easy to do with tools that we know very well so make sure the thing is there we have a concentration for it and then look at the other ingredients and we might have to make some kind of value judgment as to whether they're solventy um, you know you can imagine a variety of different ways to do that. Some are more difficult than others. But the key is that it's not that hard to pick out um, mixtures that qualify for the criteria since we're trying to model, model solubility. And now once we have this collection, uh, unlike the previous example, we're not just, you know, we, we want to do more than just look at it. We want to actually unpack this content. And it's pretty straightforward once again with a second script to create a kind of free Wilson-like table. Uh, so the columns in this case instead of being structural fragments, they're actually whole components from somewhere in the mixture. And so each one is a whole molecule. And so the response is basically the solubility of our active ingredient, the theophylline, and each of the uh, values within the table is the uh, relative proportion of that solvent. And so there are, um, some of these papers actually have done modeling of various sorts to try to find the best combination. So I'm not actually gonna delve into that, but I just, um, I'm pretty sure everyone will recognize this as the correct form for a QSAR-like study. I mean, you can take whatever modeling tools you're, you, you are familiar with or like to use, and you could come up with a, a pretty effective way of um, uh, trading off the concentrations of these various solvents against the solubility. So um, ra rather than uh, delving too much into the modeling, I just really want to emphasize this idea that if we have the data, we have it in the right format, and we have the ability to write some pretty simple scripts, we can save ourselves all of the curation and we can run this very, very quickly on um, open data sources if they're available. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to just be a one-time thing either. We could, if, if this uh, list of publicly available mixtures was, was an ongoing collection, we could actually have it running in the background and adding more entries to our, our model generation. So, you know, you can, whatever your use case is, you can probably wrap, wrap something around it if, if you have access to the right resources. Okay, so uh, the next example I'm going to do is a kind of similar idea. It's the solubility in a variety of different solvents, but I'm switching domains somewhat. In this case, it's the ability of uh, solvent combinations, usually one of them is an ionic liquid, um, and their ability to absorb gases like uh, CO2 from a gas stream of some sort. Um, and the use case for this is pretty obvious. It's, it's very relevant to climate change, um, like say scrubbing CO2 from um, coal plants, for instance. And so unlike the last example, I'm just focusing on uh, one paper for my source data because this particular paper happened to um, reference a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other data published out there, but this is as far as I got. Um, and so the information is available in this tabular format, which I'm sure is very familiar to everyone. Um, it's the standard way of communicating structure activity data to the world. It has withstood the test of time because it's it's concise and it's it's pretty good for people, um, but for computers it's uh, is tricky. Um, so in the previous example, I kind of waved my hands and just said, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody who creates this kind of content 
would mark it up in a mix file or a minchie or something like that and just make it available to everyone. And it's kind of offloaded the problem to them. Uh, but in this example, I'm going to be a little bit more sympathetic to the people who are actually doing this work because uh, when we're doing content creation, we tend to uh, more often work in a, um, a tabular format. It's a lot more convenient, especially when we're managing you know, more data points than will fit on one screen, for example. And so you can see that I've uh, represented a, a bunch of information um, in a tabular form. You can think of this as kind of like Excel with structures. Um, and within this uh, within this form, there's actually implicit mixture information. So we can uh, look at certain columns and say, well, okay, there's a bunch of columns that are describing the gas that's being dissolved. And there are some other columns that describe the um, the, the solvents. And so it, we provide this uh, extra piece of metadata for the overall um, structure, then we can write, once again, a simple script, I'm a big fan of those, um, to go through each row in this database and use this little piece of extra information to turn each of the contents in the row into an actual uh, mixture representation. So now when we're done with all of these tabular rows, which are relatively easy to curate and collect, uh, we end up with a bunch of independent mixture descriptions, they look more like these. And so what we've got is the first entry is the gas that's being absorbed in each case, it's either CO2 or SO2. And then in the second block of um, uh, mixture components is, is the list of solvents. And most of these include an ionic liquid, but not all of them. Uh, so um, the, the idea here is each, each row is now an independent thing. So if you, it's not dependent on the original table. So you could, throw all of these into a big database and mix them up with all kinds of other things. And then your extraction script um, follows a similar procedure to what I suggested before, right? You, you look for the presence of the, the gases that you want to um, know the solubility about, and then you pick out all of the rest of the solvents um, and, and then you, you make sure that that's an interesting data point to plot on your pre-model. So once you turn it into this kind of free Wilson type display, you end up with Similar kind of thing. Uh, this one's a little harder to read because we've got a lot more columns, but I'm actually going to delve a little bit into how we would actually model this stuff. Um, so you know, as you can see, it's uh, it's ready to go for regression. So let's let's see what happens when we actually just do a very simple um, partial least, least squares regression. And so um, long story short, it it gives a, re a pretty good correlation, but it's, this is not a useful model at all. So if you just bear with me for the next couple of slides, I'm going to um, do something about that. So first of all, this is not a cross-validation study. It's self on self. And also it, it um, runs into the classic rookie mistake with QSAR in that there are a lot of columns. There are, there are 31 columns and 41 rows. So you, you're just going to get something that's massively overtrained and fairly useless. Now, um, so what often one does with QSAR is um, picks out the most uh, important columns and then just uses a, a model with fewer inputs. And then you end up with a model that has um, better predictivity, even if it doesn't have such good metrics. Uh, that don't work quite so well with this one because each solvent is represented as a distinct thing and you've either got some of it or most of the time you don't have any. So you wouldn't want to just go and remove most of these because most of the rows would now have just all zeros. Um, so we can uh, just be a little bit creative about our chem informatics and um, uh, come up with a solution for that, um, which you may have guessed already. Um, but you can uh, essentially smear the information or cross pollinate, if you like, um, across the rows. So you can take each, each entry where you have a particular solvent in a certain ratio, then you go and look at all of the other columns that have nothing in them and calculate the uh, structural similarity. So in this case, I've used the Tenomoto coefficient um, using ECFP4 fingerprints, AKA Morgan fingerprints, if you like, um, times the, the amount in the original column and then if you have more than one solvent, you just take the highest value for each one. So it kind of spreads this descriptor information across the whole matrix of, of input data uh, and it, in a way that uh, follows the similarity of the solvents to each other. So the idea is that we're, we're setting the scene um, uh, for uh, reducing the number of descriptors. And so just as a quick reality check, uh, where um, we do another uh, partially squares regression, the, the stats are still high. I mean, it's still still an invalid model for predictivity purposes. 
Uh, but one of the nice side effects of um, the PLS method is that it returns a um, significance indication for each descriptor. And so that's, you could interpret that value as being the extent to which um, a particular column is orthogonal to the others and actually important to the output. Uh, so if I um, then go, go through and filter that and just take just the uh, top 10 descriptors and I'm just going to have to tell my cat to be quiet if you'll wait one moment. Sorry about that, the downsides are working at home. Um, so this uh, uh, new, new screen shows um, the reduced descriptor set. So we've got nine descriptors that correspond to um, actual solvents from the, from the original collection, and also a final descriptor for uh, indicating whether or not it's SO2 or CO2 that's being dissolved. And so the, and these are, these are um, you know, sometimes these values are filled in from solvents that aren't actually in the list. Uh, so if we just do a um, quick uh, PLS model for that one, you see the, the correlation has gone down. It's still not cross-validation, so we don't have any real information about um, whether or not this uh, has predictivity outside of its own domain. Um, but nonetheless, we can certainly imagine that, that it may well do, because um, and it has a nice functional form in that you can pick any solvent you want, even if it's not in this list or not in the original list, and you can generate descriptor information just by structural similarity to these significant descriptors. Um, so that's where I'm gonna leave this one hanging. Um, I'm not uh, necessarily trying to convince you so much that I've solved global warming, but um, I just wanna illustrate once again that if you have a collection of information and a little bit of creativity with cheminformatics, you can actually do some fairly interesting modeling applications that um, you know, reuse all of the techniques that we've we've learned over decades for chem informatics and gotten really pretty good at, uh, but we can apply them to some new and interesting domain areas. But of course, the rate limiting step here is is always this this lack of data, and that's just something we're going to be hammering on and until it's fixed, essentially. Um, okay, so I'm just going to um, come back around for a moment, and I did make um, one reasonably egregious assumption that I, that I um, glossed over for both of the last two examples. And the first one is that I've um, essentially uh, assumed that the active um, uh, component here is um, a saturated solution. And I happen to know this is true for the data that I'm using because I had to curate it myself. But if we're just pulling it out of a big database, we don't necessarily know that. So it may be um, you know, dissolved at less, less than the amount that it, that it could be, or it might not even be dissolved at all. We don't know that. So it would be um, very, very useful, important to actually mark these mixture descriptions with some kind of a flag saying that this particular component is a saturated solution. And that, that's good to know. Um, and the other, um, you know, there's, you can make a decreasing list of, um, more, well, an increasing list of pedantic um, quibbles with the way I've done this, but the, other, the next um, one is that we're assuming that all of the other solvents are not only liquid, but they're dissolved in each other. So it's not a, it's not a, a suspension or a multiple phase um, mixture. So you know, if, if that were the case, we would be not comparing apples with apples and the model would suffer. Anyway, the, um, the, the key here is um, uh, doing such labeling is technically easy. And in fact, this whole mix file representation thing is not complicated. It's just a matter of actually uh, putting down the standards and, and using it. Um, but for the, this extra labeling, you know, we're, we're trying to think of the best way to do it that keeps everyone happy for as long as possible, because there are a lot of different vocabularies that we could choose from. If there was a a very popular ontology that described these things, we, we could use that. Uh, but we're also really looking into the um, um, terminology that IUPAC already has in their gold book. That seems like a, a lead that's really worth looking into. So we, we've only started discussing that now, but there's, there's going to be more happening there. All right, so I'm going to uh, wrap up. Um, so um, we've, this, this mixture is informatics, it, it really is, it's kind of new. Uh, people are doing stuff um, privately in some cases, but there's really no, um, there's no open um, collection of protocols or tools or anything. And so we've done a lot of the work to address that. Um, I hope that I've demonstrated that there are some interesting new workflows that come online once we have this content available to us. Uh, and there are many, many more. These are just things that I've run into or thought up. Um, 
and you know, really there, there's just an incredible amount of work to do to catch up to where um, you know, single structure property databases are. I mean, there's no Kimball, there's no PubChem. You, there, there aren't even private collections of mixtures. Not really. I mean, you could, you'd have to do quite a lot of work to, to reformat them. So you know, we're in a, in a way we're kind of starting from scratch, but on, on the positive side, we, we have all of the expertise and knowledge and tools from the, uh, you know, the regular chem informatics and all of that stuff applies and, and we've, we've worked it out mostly pretty well. Um, so really this whole thing um, either um, thrives or just becomes a collection of niche products based on whether or not we form a community around these protocols and tools. And we're um, really very enthusiastic about that happening. Um, and you know, that's one of the, the great things about working with IUPAC and NG Trust because that's, that's a huge part of their mission statement already. Um, and so, you know, basically this, this kind of data, it is going to start to become available. Um, it's just a matter of time as to um, how long it takes to really get to the point where we can do these kind of large scale activities with it. Okay, so um, I'll open it up to questions. I haven't been monitoring the chat, um, but um, before, before we go for that, I'm just, um, anything that doesn't, doesn't make it onto this um, seminar, just uh, don't be shy to reach out. Um, I'm Alex at collaborativedrug.com. Um, so you know, in, any thoughts you have, love to hear them. Uh, so with that, I, I thank you for, for showing up and listening. Excellent. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Alex, uh, for a great talk. It's a really tricky topic, right? Uh, stereochemistry, mixtures, yeah, those uh, eternal topics in cheminformatics. It's great that you tackle that. It's really important, I think. Um, yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. And um, there's one comment from uh, Andreas. Um, great presentation. We have tried to, to extend it to nanomaterials as well. Um, Andreas, do you want to say something about that publication? Or it's just for information uh, for everyone? Yes, hello Andreas, thank you. Um, actually, in this publication, we have tried to analyze the requirements of, of the nanomaterials because um, uh, nanomaterials are very, very specific molecules. And more or less, we, uh, we have inspired from Alex's work um, for the mixtures, for the, uh, for, uh, for the mixture, for, uh, because that would be the most suitable in order to encode this complex structure of nanomaterials. Um, in this paper, um, uh, more or less, we, we have tried to, to align the particular concept uh, to nanomaterials, and this is the alpha version, and, and soon we'll open, we'll open this, uh, this work also to scientists around the world. Or, already a lot of scientists have participated in this work, but for sure, for the beta version, um, um, we will include um, a lot of scientists and groups from around the world. And Alex, uh, is an open invitation for you if, if you would like to participate in this attempt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure um, I, I don't, I'm not an expert in nanomaterials, but I, I, I understand that there can be combinations of things that are, some of them are straightforward to represent as. Um, you know, simple structures the way you normally do them, but others are not so easy. Like, you know, how would you capture nanotubes um, a variety, variety of sizes in a, in a CTAB data structure, that kind of thing. Um, so I'd be especially interested to hear about how you deal with those kinds of issues. Um, and, you know, and, and I also understand that there, there are a lot of cases where the, the only really good way to describe what you what you have in your mixture is actually to say how it was made and that that's that's real tricky stuff that we haven't really looked into yet so i'd like to yeah excellent great thank you yeah the link is given in the uh, in the chat for everyone for everyone's interest yeah and peter mara rust uh, has a comment as well peter are you there uh, yes so i'm there um so first of all i uh, agree this is a really important uh, problem it's also extremely challenging and the biggest challenge is actually getting a community together. Um, that's what Inchi managed to do 20 years ago. Um, the reason it's difficult is because chemistry is very messy at the edges and uh, Inchi works because molecules, uh, organic molecules are well defined and they've only got three things in. They've got atoms, uh, bonds, 
and, uh, and charge. And if you do that, you can reduce it to mathematics. And that's why Inchi works. But as soon as you come on to uh, at least two other things, three other things, uh, one is names. So there are 50 different names for drugs. We've seen them already uh, earlier this um, uh, session. You have to normalize them. You cannot assume that everybody will use the same name as you. The second is floating point. You cannot normalize floating point. Uh, and you've got a number of ratios. And the third and probably the most difficult is the relationship between components of a complex object. Uh, so uh, how do you say that this particular uh, component has this role as opposed to that? Now, uh, we actually uh, modeled all of this, um, uh, you know, uh, 15 years ago in CML. It's all there if you want it. Uh, these problems won't go away. They are the fundamentally the same problems. And I would say that um, it doesn't matter whether it's XML, whether it's JSON, but you must have a uh, semantic uh, syntax uh, to deal with this because you've got to be able to extend it. And the Inchi format will break down. I mean, I can promise you that. Uh, trying to fit things into Inchi, trying to fit things into mall files, into square tables and so on, just isn't going to, um, survive. Uh, so um, uh, the positive thing on identifiers, on things like your solvent names, is that the biggest public collection of metadata is now Wikidata. And that is the area where uh, I'm working and uh, many other people are working. Akon Villikaugan, for example, is working. Uh, you know, a number of people are working to canonicalize the whole of the naming problem. So if you want a solvent, you uh, don't refer to it by name, you refer to it by its Wikidata ID. And that, to a large extent, uh, solves that problem. Uh, sorry, I put my video on if anybody wants to see. Um, so I'm happy to be, you know, I'm happy to make constructive um, uh, contributions here on the basis that, uh, you know, the community agrees that it has to work together. But this is a difficult problem. And I would say uh, that extending the Inchi format is probably not uh, the best way to do it. You need a formula which is going to be infinitely extensible and JSON or XML do those pretty well today. All right, um, I'll, I'll respond to some of those I've been making notes. Um, first of all, um, I totally agree that um, community building is really, really hard. It makes software engineering look pretty easy. Um, um, uh, definitely heard on the chemistry is messy part. Um, and I, I tried to highlight that in this, this idea that we're, we're capturing um, the level of uns the level of certainty that you have, not the level that you would like to have, and so we can work with um, ambiguity or missing information. It's still it doesn't break the format. Um, normalization of names, uh, we kind of dodged that problem really, um, uh, in in that we would much you know the names are kind of considered human readable, and that's it. They're not really a part of the informatics. So um, we would much rather have links to or or well defined identifiers. To specific places that have well-defined meanings, you know, we consider like like an INCA name or a cast number or a pubkin, whatever. Um, you know, those those have real meaning. The the name descriptions and that's just that's just icing for people. Um, in terms of uh, relationships between components, we've deliberately not addressed that because it's just such an enormous subject. So we are concentrating more on just um, describe trying to describe what's there. And we're taking a you know, most most important stuff first, and then working our way through. So you know, we're starting from nothing. So just hierarchy, structure, quantity. You can just get those things. You know, we've we've solved sixty percent of the problem, or you know, 40, 40 or eighty percent, depending on which industry you're in. You know, but um, we've also made sure that the the mix file format itself is very easy to extend. As as you say, JSON, XML, they're both very extendable, and we have some preliminary. Um, guidelines for how to add content. Um, we're still kind of nailing that down, I, um, but it, you know, it's, it's not that complicated and there is a mechanism there. There is a schema of sorts. Um, you know, I can't, can't say we've really used it that much, but if you read our paper, it's, um, it's out there. 
Um, so yeah, the, the CML content, that is an inspiration for a lot of what we've been doing. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, heard on Wikidata and stuff. I mean, it'd be cool if that was all in there. Um, and uh, yeah, any, any, any feedback that you have, love to hear it. Did I cover most of it? Well, my feedback would take about an hour. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm not going to do so that now. My email address is on that slide there. Uh, it really depends what you want and where you see this going. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I can put you into the same breakout room afterwards. So Peter and I just stay around. I can put you together. So you can discuss that for two hours if you wish. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot for your contribution, Alex. Uh, much appreciated. And I would like to thank uh, all the speakers of today, please. Um, so uh, Albert, Andrew, as well as Alex. So uh, fantastic, great. Thanks a lot, everyone in the audience for joining as well. Uh, so our next meeting will be on the 2nd of June. Uh, please join us again and please stay around as well uh, for our breakout rooms, for our pub night, so to speak. So go to the fridge, uh, get your drink. Uh, I will put you into breakout rooms and stay as long uh, as you wish, please. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. I hope to see you around soon. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andreas.